What's going on, guys? Welcome to episode seven of No Late Fees. Leo and I are back to talk about one of my personal favorite movies and also one of your personal favorite movies, Ghostbusters from 1984, the original, the OG. With everything going on with Ghostbusters right now, the this continuing surge of love for this franchise, how can we not talk about this one? Yeah, man, we got our tickets already. We're going to see it at the end of the week. So fingers crossed that Frozen Empire is great. I hope it is. Listen, they've got Ernie in charge of the Ghostbusters right now, so what could go wrong? <laughs> He's actually my favorite Ghostbuster. Such an underused, <laughs> underrated Ghostbuster. And, you know, he's got the tools. He's got the talent. Talent! <laughs> and we had the tools. We had the talent. It's Miller time. Uh, Ernie's the man. I fucking, I love Ernie. Ghostbusters from 1984, directed by Ivan Reitman, in my opinion, was a cult comedy phenomenon. It falls in the category, personally, as one of those movies that I can just put on mute. And I, I know it from beginning to end. There's like Ghostbusters, Ninja Turtles, Batman, Batman Returns, and RoboCop. Those are like my five movies. As I throw up a 10, but my five movies. I know movies. five movies. <laughs> I know five movies. Yeah, but it was it was huge that year. It was, I believe it was a $29 or $30 million budget. It pulled in almost $230 million. It took the highest spot of all time that year. None of them were expecting this from this little comedy that... You know, they spent a couple of years writing and putting together, but this was probably one of the shortest f actual filmed project that I know about. Like they, I think they made it in like six or eight months they had to. to it was, it, it was a little less than a year. It was a little less yeah. than a year. They gave them like and, 11 months or something like that. And especially uh, for any movie, especially in the mid eighties, that was not a lot of time to make a movie with everything being practical and everything for the most part being filmed on location or having to have huge sets being built. They really had to hustle the hustle effects to get this that movie. they wanted done. Yeah. So the original script uh, was written by Dan Aykroyd and it was a lot different than the story that we ended up seeing on screen. It was a futuristic story where due to a tear in Earth's dimension, New York City was overrun with ghost energy leading to a new profession ghostbusting or ghostbusters whatever you want to call it but ghostbusters was the new profession and it was kind of like uh plumbers or blue collar contractors exterminators that kind of thing the original team that we were supposed to follow was one of many it wasn't just the one team that we follow in oh. the actual movie it was one of many so it would be you know a team in brooklyn a team in manhattan a team in yonkers a team over here and over there so they were all over like a Batman Incorporated type situation. Yeah, so they would be Very common. Cool. I like that. Yeah. They would have been common, like like I said, like blue collar contractors or exterminators. They, they would have been the the paranormal janitors, if you will. The original team was supposed to be Dan Aykroyd, John Belushi, and Eddie Murphy. That's interesting. Oh. You didn't know that? I didn't know. No. Yeah. I knew John Belushi probably would have been involved in it because he was friends with all of them. But yeah, uh, Eddie Murphy is an interesting I believe he was doing Beverly Hills Cop. Yeah, that's so about right. He didn't take it up for that. And obviously, Belushi unfortunately passed away. The first initial script, Reitman convinced Aykroyd to retool the plot, grounding it more in reality and in current day New York versus uh, like a futuristic one. And also making the Ghostbusters college professors instead of ghost janitors, like I said before. Reitman then brought on Harold Ramis for the co-write and for the new script. He worked on Animal House. He worked on Meatballs, Stripes. So he obviously had, you know, a thing for good comedies. And oh, yeah. that team, that team was just a good team to put together to make this one. And a lot of the, the quote unquote good lines were actually written for Winston. But Reitman had him dial it back. And they're like, dude, you can't give all the best lines oh. to, to the fourth lead. You got to give these to, to Murray. <laughs> And, you yeah. know, rightfully so. It's Bill fucking Murray. And those three, you know, nothing against Ernie Hudson, but those three are so good at just improvising stuff. So you might have oh, something yeah. gold written on paper, but they'll probably change it up when it comes to actually filming it. The blend of of great written jokes and just improvising everything. It was just it was perfect. You give them a jumping off point and they're creative enough, smart enough, talented enough to know Okay, I can go here. I can go there. Let's take it there. Let's see how far I can go with it. All right, so the movie opens up at the New York Public Library, uh, the library and ghost scare scene. Dude, the score for this really just sets the tone for the whole movie. It really just kicks in with that, like, dee, 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 dee. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. And you're like, oh, 
okay, is yep. this a comedy? Is this a is this a horror? What what am I gonna be watching right now? And that whole scene was all practical. All like the library cards flying up was just pressurized air that pushed them. Classic 80s effects that mm -hmm. nowadays I feel like they would go in and try to digitize that just to make it easier on themselves. Like, all right, cool. Like, here's the stuff. Foo -foo -foo -foo. Click, click, click. Done. The theme song kicks in. Ghostbusters logo pops up. Who you gonna call? We meet uh, Dr. Peter Bankman, who is running psychic reading experiments on two volunteers, uh, one male and one female. And we get a perfect introduction to Bankman's personality and sense of humor. Nothing sets it more than Venkman burn in hell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that's on the on the door. <laughs> it's just written across <laughs> this door. Well, OK, who are we about to meet? <laughs> he's torturing the male and he's telling the female that she's guessing every single card correctly. Because he's just flirting with her. He will do anything for uh, a chance with anyone at this point. So if it means making her look like a psychic, then by all means, here we are. The actor uh, who plays the male, he even said when he was done filming, he had bruises all over his thigh because he kept <laughs> pinching himself every time he was getting the electric shocks. So he was just pinching the shit out of himself and his gum would pop out. He's setting up a, a date with the, the female, and then Ray barges in to inform Peter about a ghost sighting at the library. It blew books off shelves from 20 feet away and scared the socks off some poor librarian. A free-floating, full-torso, vaporous apparition. They go to investigate the library where we we meet uh, Dr. Egon Spangler for the first time, and he has like his stethoscope, and he's like listening for sounds on the <laughs> library table. Oh, just, I wrote down oh. that same moment, too, because like, <laughs> obviously, like, they're here to bust ghosts, but... Venkman's just there to like dick around. He's like, all right, yeah, cool, yeah. He's just, like oh, he starts like tapping the table, <laughs> trying to like freak him out, and just bangs on it. <laughs> Classic Venkman just proving that, all right, cool, I'll I'll go wherever the the homies are going. All right, yeah. What are we doing today? Cool, let's go. Even in the most serious of potential situations, like he's gonna fuck around. So they interview Alice, the librarian. They ask her about um any history of mental health in her family. If she's using drugs, are you Alice menstruating right now? Menstruating. <laughs> Are you, Alice, menstruating right now? What has that got to do with it? Back off, man. I'm a scientist. What has that got to do with it? Back off, man. I'm a scientist. The original line for that was actually, fuck off, man. I'm a scientist. What was this movie? PG? I, was, I believe it was PG. This movie would have been borderline rated R if it came out today. If they had done it the way they wanted to, yeah. Fucking, we'll get into it later, but Ray gets a blowjob from a ghost. That wouldn't have flown in today's society. No way. The ghost would have. The talented fucking ghost. <laughs> so they go downstairs and they start trying to find the ghost and they find the ghost reading a book and they attempt to make contact with her. Stay close. Stay close. Now stay close. Stay close. Do exactly as I say. Ready? Ready? Get her. Get her. <laughs> Get her. <laughs> the dumbest fucking idea ever. But you know what? Like the score again just like sets you up the whole basement scene on that like super eerie path. And they should have known that yelling was a terrible choice for a library. Oh, that's a like awful, awful <laughs> fucking already, choice. She already shushed you. There's a big jump scare with a huge puppet that's all practical again. And they run out, just like you said, with the with the music of them being chased out. The score for this is fantastic, by the way. Egon says, according to these new readings, we have an excellent chance at catching a ghost. And the idea of going into the ghost hunting business is born. Can we just talk about how like Venkman is is essentially the bitch of the Ghostbusters group <laughs> when they needed it back in back in the library when they needed samples and stuff? They're like, Venkman, here, go scoop goo. You're <laughs> you're not doing anything. We're both holding all this important equipment. We, we have these scientific things to do. Like, can can you be useful? Go go pick up goo. Egon. Your mucus. Egon, your mucus. I think he likes that he's the quote unquote mucus guy because he's obviously the inferior scientist when compared to Ray and Egon. So he gets to kind of like play that he's a scientist too, but also he's the funny guy. He's the guy who breaks the tension. He's the guy that could hit on girls and say sleazy comments. His character, I don't think would exist well in today's movies. I would find no. it fucking hilarious, I, but. I, 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 Right. He may have gotten canceled a few years ago. Uh, yeah. 
had this not been the 80s. That does not take away my love and appreciation for Peter Venkman. However, no. uh, I, I do know that uh, times being what they are, he would not have uh, received such uh, star-like reviews in this day and age. <laughs> Going along with Peter's character, he convinces Ray to take out a loan against his parents' house to raise the funds for their paranormal investigations. I forget the interest rate, but it's a ridiculously high interest rate. Ray, for your information, the interest rate alone for the first five years comes to $95,000. They get to the firehouse and they meet a real estate agent because they're looking for somewhere, you know, to call their home base, which is Hook and Ladder 8 in Soho, New York. Real location, real firehouse. All the exterior shots were the Hook and Ladder 8 in New York. The interior shots were from a fire department in L.A. L.A., yeah. I need to go to this location. I need to stand in front of the the glory that is the, the firehouse. Living in New Jersey and being this close, I, I There's feel no like reason I have... to have not seen it already. I passed by by accident last week, which I showed you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's so jealous. I was at a red light. I was like, oh, shit. There it is. <laughs> Bankman's trying to talk to the real estate agent and not make it seem obvious that they want it. And all of a sudden, Ray's like, hey, guys, does this pole still work? Wow, this place is great. When can we move in? You got to try this pole. <laughs> you got to try this pole. I'm going to get my stuff. I love how he asks, does the pole still work? As opposed to if it's mechanical, like did they turn it on? No, bro, you just slide down it. They take it and they move in. Next, we meet uh, Dana Barrett, played by Sigourney Weaver. We finally get the Sigourney Weaver. Any movie that's got Sigourney Weaver in it, sign me the fuck up. I love yep. her and everything. Ripley all day long. She's coming back to her apartment from grocery shopping. We see in the background the cheesy Ghostbusters commercial. The Are you troubled in the middle of the night? You or any of your family ever seen a spook, specter, or ghost? We're ready to believe you. Believe you. you. <laughs> We're ready to believe you. I love how they. <laughs> so Dana naturally scoffs at the commercial, turns off the TV, and she's putting away her groceries. And the eggs are on the counter, and all of a sudden they start popping and cracking and cooking on her countertop. And she yeah. hears a growl coming from from her refrigerator she opens the fridge we see one of the terror dogs that we'll meet later on in the film she just screams slams the door shut now i feel very sad for her because she bought a whole bag of stay puffed marshmallows that were there with her eggs and those were not affected it was just the eggs which is surprising because i would have i would have liked to see some some gooey marshmallow goodness yeah. if the countertop is heating up then wouldn't the the bag and the marshmallows just be like <laughs> That's Soggy, too many questions. Runny. Well, this is what happens when we watch movies now. Like this, these are the things well, I notice. That scene does tease two things. So you see the little bag of marshmallows that has a Stay Puft Marshmallow Man logo on it, and when she opens the fridge door, which is uh, very Jurassic Park three like, when the the raptor speaks in the dream scene in Jurassic Park three. <laughs> Alan, <laughs> the terror dog yeah. goes Zool. So we get two little teases from that that'll pay off later in the movie. Back at the firehouse, the Ghostbuster sign is being put up. It's being hung up. Ray shows up with the hunk of junk car, the Cadillac, that will eventually become the Ecto-1. This scene is interesting because they had to hang up ghost breakers on the side of the building as well. That's right. They had Ghostbusters, Ghost Breakers, Ghost Fighters. There was like four or five different names they were going to do. And every time Ghostbusters was either on the screen or the name Ghostbusters was spoke, they would do alternate takes for the other name. And then by Just the end case. of filming, they would have all those different cuts and then, you know, splice together whichever name they, they landed on. Ghost Blasters! Ghost, Ghost Stoppers! We're ready to believe you! And they said, fuck it, that's going to be too expensive. So they ended up just buying the rights from Filmation, which had the Saturday morning cartoon Ghostbusters, and they were allowed to use the name. So Dana shows up at the firehouse. Bankman, who is getting impatient on not having any customers yet. Bankman notices she's there. He perks up. Extremely excited Bank Bankman. And Dana is their first potential customer. And the flirting begins. So all three of them run tests on Dana as she's like explaining her experience at her apartment. And Ray and Egon plan to investigate the name Zool. And Peter plans to go check out Dana's apartment, which he stumbles while he's he's like, I'll go to her apartment and check her out. I mean, I'll go to Dana's apartment and check out the apartment. I'll take Miss Barrett back to her apartment and check her out. 
I'll go check out Miss Barrett's apartment. I'll go with Dana to check out the apartment. They go back to her apartment, her and Bankman, and they investigate the apartment. And he's using a tool that he obviously has no idea how to use it or what it does, but he plays it off cool. She calls him out for it and he tries to deflect it, but she sees right through his bullshit, which is All awesome. Day. All day. It makes it even funnier because like now you yeah. know everything he's going to do is going to fail. <laughs> and just like when we talked about Robocop, a few episodes ago when we talked about lewis we pointed out how it was refreshing to see her character didn't fall into the cliche of just ditzy female characters in the 80s dana barrett is in that same category she's not yep. dumb she's not ditzy she doesn't need to be saved all the time she's smart she sees through things so she falls in that category for me i love that the piano bit was was improv that was just bill fucking around he was just like uh they they hate they this. hate this we love the torture room <laughs> <laughs> she's obviously creeped out by him and shuts him down kicks his ass out of the apartment <laughs> they get their first call they suit up for the first time we see the completed echo one, one. As soon as they slide down that pole, the score just kicks from like we had a nice like horror movie score the entire first say the first act. Second act comes through all of a sudden. All right, cool. We're we're the goofy ghostbusters. Yeah. So they suit up for the first time. We see the completed Act 01 and they race out of the firehouse. So first off, let's just talk about how the siren for Ecto-1, it is a uh, leopard howl edited and played backwards at different speeds. So yep, they just changed the pitch. Yeah, just like. It's possibly the most annoying fucking siren ever by oh the way God, terrible <laughs> so this brings us to the cedric hotel scene which is I... in my opinion it is the best scene in the movie and in my opinion this scene sums up everything great about the ghostbusters in one scene the witty back and forth dialogue the humor of the situation the practical effects with slimer the action the unique traits of our protagonists we see that all in one scene so on top of all that, this scene also serves as an introduction to all of their tech and how it works. It shows how they're just winging this whole thing. They don't know if anything is going to work. They're performing all of the, the tests on the job. Each of us is wearing an unlicensed nuclear accelerator on his back. Switch me on. <laughs> you know it's bad when Egon's obviously the one who made all this equipment. The proton pack gets switched on. And then Egon is the one who goes like this. Egon is the one who backs off. Elmer Bernstein's score, this is, in my opinion, it's the most memorable scene music-wise. Like when they're creeping through the hallway. Dun, 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 dun. I love it, man. <laughs> so they come out of the elevator and they're looking around the hotel hallways and this is where we meet slimer everyone knows slimer the big neon green ghost and the special effects with him are awesome it's 100 percent practical effects there's one performer inside of the rubber suit and then there's a half dozen puppeteers controlling various parts of slimer's body watching that happen is fantastic just hands yeah. and things just going yeah and his body's going like blah, 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 blah. it's super interesting to think that slimer was intended to be the spirit of john belushi they replicated belushi's uh, mannerisms his facial expressions in the puppeteer's performances it's awesome the way his eyebrows move the way his smile looks and that's just you know paying tribute to obviously a close friend of dan Aykroyd's. bankman finds slimer in the hallway he's looking at me ray i think he could hear you and then all of a sudden, you just see Slimer. <laughs> and that's where they got the name from. So the whole he's slimy thing stuck so much that they just started calling him Slimer. It's slime me. That's great, Ray. Save some for me. <laughs> that's right, bitch. Get more goo. Sample it out. We'll get back to work now. Come, come now. They track Slimer down in the ballroom. They attempt to catch him, and they're just fucking trashing that room, dude. This, hold on. <laughs> you knew shit was going to go down because when Ray closes the doors to the ballroom, the shit-eating grin that he has, he's like, 
don't worry, everything's fine. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I always wanted to do this. He pulls the the, the tablecloth off. <laughs> the flowers are still standing. Are still standing. <laughs> you remember when you see Slimer flying around the chandelier? Yeah. That's actually a peanut spray painted green. <laughs> because the puppeteers lost the miniature and they needed one more shot. So they just spray painted a peanut and hoping no one would notice. Peanuts and just like, yeah. oh, well, whatever. And it worked and it made the film. They're setting a perimeter, and this is the first time we get the mention of don't cross the streams. Don't cross the streams. It would be bad. I'm fuzzy on the whole good, bad thing. What do you mean bad? This kid's is called foreshadowing. Imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. That's bad. That's bad. So we don't do that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Safety Check. tip. Don't do that. So they continue to destroy the ballroom, and Egon and Bankman throw confinement streams to contain Slimer as Ray sets the trap. I love how he goes, don't look directly into the trap. I looked at the trap, Ray. <laughs> don't look directly into the trap. I looked at the trap, Ray. You have someone who is so intelligent as Egon, but he's still curious enough as a human being that he looks directly into the trap. This is partly a serious question, partly an ongoing joke because it's, you know, also on my arm. Um, so what is the trap connected to? Where does it plug into? Like, does it what what do they use? Like they, they have to throw it out and it's always on a cord. Uh -huh. So is it is that cord just connected to the pump or is it that, that actually like plugged into something? Because like, well, sir, you... if you had if you had the trap toy as a kid, you would know that stepping on that button sends air into the, the trap that blows the doors open. And that's how you trap ghosts. That's how I learned it anyway. Dude, when I was a kid, uh, we lived in a smaller apartment and in between the apartments, there was like a little alleyway. And when it was really windy, it made these whistling noises. And when I was a kid, dude, I used to go door to door charging a few dollars per neighbor to, to inspect their house and go through their house with my little proton pack and my trap just to make sure there were no ghosts in the neighborhood. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> so proud of you for that. They successfully trapped Slimer, or as they put it, the class five full roaming vapor. They charged the hotel manager $5,000 for the entrapment and, and the storage. They've got a lot of loans to pay off. They just refurbished mm -hmm. a whole firehouse and a car. So that shit don't pay for itself. And you could tell this is most likely the first time they've actually gotten paid because as they're trying to figure out what to charge the hotel manager, he's like looking over at Egon to give him like, you know, amounts. Oh, that'll be loved too. Yeah. So that will only cost you uh, $2,000. We have a special going on entrapment. So that's only going to cost you $2,000 for a total of five big ones. $5,000? $5, I simply I won't, pay, won't it. pay it. Well, that's all right. We can just put it right back in there. Thank oh, you. Oh, we certainly can, no. Dr. Beckman. No. no! They get paid, and then next we see the montage of business picking up. So the whole tri-state area is getting overrun with ghosts everywhere at an extremely alarming rate, and this montage just shows us perfectly how much is really happening. From Larry King to Casey Kasem, all of the greats <laughs> know about the Ghostbusters. They're catching ghosts throughout New York and all over the tri-state area. They are very quickly becoming celebrities. The Ghostbusters theme song is playing over the montage. <laughs> So there is a very controversial clip in that montage. Ray gets a blowjob from a ghost. <laughs> How could I forget? So Ray gets a fucking blowjob from a ghost, and the scene was originally intended to be more fleshed out, where it was going to be Ray and Winston at an army barrack uh, investigating a ghost from the Revolutionary War. But the editors saw that it was going to kind of break up the speed of the montage, so they just cut it, and they just <laughs> added it to the montage, so it would work better as a full clip versus an extended scene that kind of broke up like what was going on when we were obviously jumping ahead. But when we meet Walter Peck and they're about to get arrested at the firehouse, Winston and uh, Ray are coming back over the bridge by themselves. So they're coming back from investigating that scene. So that's why they're all split up. And if you look on when Ray's laying down fucking about to get the blow job, there's just a sword leaning against the bed. <laughs> Casually, you know, you, just in case the proton pack doesn't work. Business has picked up so much, getting back to your point, that they need to hire we another finally Ghostbuster. finally get to meet Winston. Yes. That brings us to Winston Zeddemore, played by Ernie Hudson, who is my personal favorite Ghostbuster. The man, the myth, the motherfucking legend. He represents us, the audience. 
You know what I mean? His perspective throughout the whole movie and not having any, any experience with the Ghostbusters, it just paints certain problems and cer- certain situations that his experiences explain to us. So we figure out what's going on through him. So not only does he help answer the questions of the viewers, he's just an all around likable character. 100%. Down for whatever. So he's just a pleasure to have on the screen. Speaking of having him on the screen, he was, I guess, at least originally supposed to be introduced from the beginning. The yeah. and like some versions of the script, he was introduced like somewhere around page six. And then yep. I guess somewhere throughout the the process, next thing he knew, he was on page sixty eight. I would have loved to see like an iteration where you know we had the Sedgwick with Winston, or like yeah, yeah, another instance where he was there. So like I I love how they introduced him, but I definitely would have loved to see another version of him being there a little sooner. They they set up the the date with Dana and Peter, and that brings us to Ray explaining the containment unit to Winston. And as that is going on, they get a visit from the EPA and we meet Walter Peck, who serves as a nosy skeptic antagonist towards the Ghostbusters for the remainder of the movie. Walter Peck threatens Vankman with a court order to search the premises. And Vankman threatens back saying he'll sue him for wrongful prosecution and kicks him out of the firehouse. William Atherton is just an absolute fantastic straight man to like yeah. bounce off of Bill Murray's shenanigans. You can have it your way, Mr. Vankman. <laughs> like a very hoity toity <laughs> type. Like, ugh. Yeah. he was just the perfect pecker to play peck. You could have it your way, Mr. Vankman. Yeah, he's he's fantastic. Their characters are complete opposites, so they just butt heads beautifully. It is the peanut butter and jelly (laughs) that we need for this movie. (laughs) Walter is the pain in the ass of the Ghostbusters and even gets them thrown in fucking jail before the final act. He is a thorn in their sides definitely throughout the entire movie. So this one was running a little long, so we decided to cut it into two parts. So make sure you guys subscribe and keep a lookout for part two, which will be coming soon. Thanks, guys.